The scripture reading for today is found in Luke 5, 18 through 25, and comes from the New Revised Standard Version. Just then, some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, who is this man who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go to your home. Immediately, he stood up before them took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Before I start, I would like to give a huge thank you, as well as credit, to Mary McCluskey, who serves as FUMC's Access Team Coordinator, and who also helped me prepare this sermon. She's also been a friend who has spent time with me, gracious, graciously allowing me to look at theology and faith from her perspective, and therefore has broadened my understanding of disability ministry. She tells me that I have done the same for her as far as, far as racial justice goes, so I guess it's a case of iron sharpens iron. So the title of this two-part sermon series is No Body or Mind Left Behind. And for this first part, we will be looking at physical disabilities or differing abilities. And then next week, we will look at mental illnesses and chronic pain. In the scripture passage that we heard this morning, a group of friends have come to where Jesus is teaching, carrying a good friend of theirs who is paralyzed on a mat. They are desperately trying to make their way through the gathered crowd so that Jesus can heal him. They are not having much success, but these friends are so determined to have their friend healed that they go up on the roof, break through the tiles, and then lower their friend down into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. I wonder what the homeowner thought of that. Jesus, however, seeing the great faith and determination of the friends, says to the man on the mat, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now this is a rather strange thing to say to a paralyzed man who has been lowered through the roof on a mat. And it also greatly disturbs the scribes and the Pharisees, but for other reasons. But for me, to speak of sin first is a strange thing to say to someone who is paralyzed and seeking healing. His sins are forgiven. But what sins? What did he do? What exactly is sin? Getting a consensus on the definition of the word sin in Christian circles is challenging, if not outright impossible. So, going by my personal understanding, sin is something that separates me spiritually from God. It is not God that does the separating, nor does God judge, condemn, or withhold love for me from me for anything that I do or don't do. It's all me. When I feel guilty or ashamed about something, if I'm not careful, I tend to turn away or allow a separation or a distance to develop between me and God. 
challenges of any sort and the difficult emotions that they bring up, you know, like grief, loneliness, hopelessness, anger, fear, frustration, despair, and so on, can have the effect of separating us from God. And this makes me wonder what this man on the mat had been wrestling with, and for how long. Mary McCluskey has shared with me that very often people living with disabilities feel less qualified and not good enough compared to other people, that they ache to be able to do what others do and desperately want to be included. They feel separated. They feel self-conscious of their noticeable disability and they very often feel like they have to apologize. Very often they feel and probably are discriminated against. As Christians, we believe that we are all created in the image and likeness of God. So why is it that people with disabilities or differing abilities would believe that they are flawed or less than? Why would they experience shame or any of those other oppressive emotions? Why do they feel separated? The answer, unfortunately, is us. As a culture, we tend to value people by what they can do or produce or how they perform, what disability justice advocates call commodity relations and capitalist notions of productivity. We have somehow created this idea of normal and when people fall outside of our perceived idea of what is normal, they become other, less than, or inferior. Very often when we do this, it is not intentional. It all happens at a subconscious level, as implicit bias. When we make plans or decisions based on what works for us, without considering the impact on those who have disabilities, we can also effectively physically exclude them from our presence as there may be barriers to their participation. Very often people with disabilities may also be facing other forms of oppression that just compound their exclusion. Mary McCluskey and I partnered up with Amy Kennedy earlier this year as we explore the concept of intersectionality and disability in a disability awareness talk for Black History Month. So intersectionality describes overlapping systems of oppression. For instance, being a person of color and being disabled, being a woman and being disabled, or LGBT and disabled, or any other combination of multiple marginal identities. This just magnifies the sense of separation, as well as the discrimination. In a book that Mary McCluskey and I read called Disability and the Church, A Vision for Diversity and Inclusion, the author, Lamar, Lamar Hardwick, describes how we have two models for how we look at disability. We have a medical model for disability which focuses on a person's disability or impair impairment as the sole source of the person's challenges. In this model, impairment is seen as a deficit that subtracts from the quality of life and needs to be repaired. This has the potential to create low expectations for those with disabilities. The social model, on the other hand, contends that the actual impairment is not what is most disabling. The social model asserts that society has structured itself in a way that is unfriendly to the disabled community. Hardwick adds that, unfortunately, the church is often, often complicit in neglecting to engage in an understanding of the social model of disability. The impact 
is an eventual descent into a form of prejudice against disabled people known as ableism. God created all in God's image and likeness. And we've kind of messed it up with our standards of normal, not God's, and our exclusions. When we go back to the scripture account of the paralyzed man, I see Jesus telling the man, friend, your sins are forgiven. And here is my paraphrase of this. Friend, I have removed your sense of separation from God. And then Jesus turns to the scribes and the Pharisees and says, oh, and by the way, I can do that. And then they are outraged. But by telling him this, he is reinstating the man's God-given image bearer status without changing his paralyzed condition. I wonder if Jesus sees this as more important than the physical healing that he then later does. Lamar Hardwick believes that the primary goal of Jesus' healing ministry was to establish a means for individuals had been, who had been excluded to re-enter the community that had isolated them because of their disability. Many social commentators have observed that with the arrival of the pandemic and the stay-at-home orders, all of a sudden there was radical accessibility. You know, from our church's perspective, we immediately switched to online services, sending our church to where people were. We launched the doorstep disciples who checked in on people and made deliveries. We started Zoom happiness hours and many other activities. We also became more mindful, careful, and conscious of our more vulnerable friends in our community. So Beth Pascoe recently shared a podcast with me where Brene Brown interviewed Priya Parker on the topic, how we return and how it matters. In the interview, Priya Parker urged all of us to reflect on what we have learned during the pandemic about access and equity. How do we still include, as part of our community, those who choose not to return? Or those who can't return? This is something that we're currently thinking about and working on as a church staff. It includes maintaining digital ministry, offering hybrid participation in meetings and classes, as well as an intentional awareness and inclusion of those who have been historically excluded. How do we also connect with those who have felt disconnected from church life during the pandemic because of the challenges of technology? We want to be a community of hope, a place of radical belonging. We want to be good friends. So here are some ideas for how we can do that. We've been offering our disability awareness talks for three years now, and they'll be returning in this fall on the fourth Sundays of the month. Join us to discuss topics and issues that people with disabilities face on a daily basis. We will also be launching a book study this fall on the book that I mentioned, um, Disability and the Church, A Vision for Diversity and Inclusion by Lamar Hardwick. And Mary McCluskey also said to contact her if you would like to join the access team. As far as building accessibility goes, the major church renovations in 2000, as well as those done in 2016 that were based upon the accessibility audit, they've done much to improve the accessibility of the physical building and we will continue to be more mindful of other improvements. And with the move to worshiping outside, Mary was able to give us guidance on potential accessibility issues. But we always need additional eyes and perspectives to help us to see where there might be limitations and barriers. Help us with this. 
We also need to continually look to see who is missing and find out why. Then we can explore how we can fully include them in the life of the church. Their presence matters. There is a great deal of forgiveness that we are in need of as a culture that prizes able bodies, people, for the way that we have viewed and treated those who are different to us. It took a team of friends who saw and loved the paralyzed man, who were prepared to break through a roof to get their friend to Jesus for his healing. They were determined that their friend would not be left behind. All of us are called to be those friends. There is a lot of work for us to do to change our culture so that our friends with physical and mental differences are fully accepted for who and how they are without needing to try and change them. Let's be roof-breaking friends and make sure that nobody is left behind.